Welcome back to Face the Nation. Here's more of our conversation with Senator Kirsten Sinema in Sedona last week. I want to ask you about a quote that stood out to me that was in a recent New York Times profile of you. It quotes you as saying, one of the big problems in negotiations is that often some, not exclusively men, but often men, are so busy talking about what they need, they're not spending any time hearing what someone else needs. If you give them what they need, you can get what you want. So on May 9th, five men, including the President of the United States and four congressional leaders, are gonna meet to discuss the standoff over the debt ceiling. You've been listening. What does a deal look like? Mm. I've been disappointed with the conversations up to date. Both parties are talking without listening to each other. They're just talking right past each other, mm -hmm. right? So President Biden says, I want a clean debt limit to meet the full faith and responsibility of the United States of America. To be clear, he's correct. We must meet the full faith and credit responsibility for the United States of America. That is our duty. However, it's not correct to assume or to pretend that either party is used to or always is willing to pass a debt limit without conditions. Mm -hmm. Both parties have played this game for years. And so we're in a situation where one party is saying they will not negotiate at all with the other party. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very dangerous place to be because one, it's not realistic. And two, that is not going, it's just not going to happen. So Kevin McCarthy, as we all saw, took him a long time to become speaker, barely squeaked by with the votes, had to make a lot of concessions to get the job. And he has a very, very, very narrow road to walk. So he has to thread a needle where he can get the votes he needs to pass a debt limit increase and continue to be speaker. Mm -hmm. Now, there have been sounds coming out from the Republican conference in the House for months Patrick McHenry, who's the chair of the House Financial Services Committee, Patrick has been talking for months about what a deal could look like. People have not been listening. They should be. I think folks should actually say, let's hear these options. Mm -hmm. The reality is the bill that Kevin and his colleagues passed with the House is not going to be the solution. Right. The votes do not exist in the United States Senate to pass that. But what the president is offering is not a realistic solution either there's not going to be just a simple clean debt limit. The votes don't exist for that. So the sooner these two guys get in the room and listen to what the other one needs, mm -hmm. the more likely they are to solve this challenge and protect the full faith and credit of the United States of America. We're in really shaky ground right now. And now we have June 1st as the X date, according That's to the right. Treasury Secretary. That's right. So do you think that gives uh, enough time for a broad agreement? If there's been no talking to date, how do they get it done? They could get it done. By um, June 1st, be yeah. well in advance, before an actual default. They could get it done, but it would be a challenge. I think what it would require is both Speaker McCarthy and the president and their respective party machines to kind of drop the facade, you know, like where they're at right now, and just sit down and talk about brass tacks. What does Kevin need in order to deliver the votes? And what does the president need in order to feel comfortable with the full faith and credit of the United States of America? Get to that point and then figure out a way to give each man what he needs. Are you weighing in on this at all? Uh, I have conversations with my colleagues every day. That sounds like a yes. Um, well, back in 2011, it was a senator who helped deliver uh, you know, coming back from the brink the last time there was the risk of, of default when right. Leader McConnell jumped in. Right now, it doesn't look like he's jumping in. I don't think he can. Why? Well, I don't think that a solution that was negotiated by Senator McConnell would carry the kind of weight that is needed with House Republican members. So I think I think Senator McConnell knows that. Which is why he's saying talk to the House. Right. Well, they'll all be in the room on That's right. May 9th. That's right. So we'll see what happens. Our full conversation with Senator Sinema is on our website and our YouTube channel. And we turn now to the chairman of the House Financial Services Committee, Patrick McHenry. Uh, Mr. Chairman, good morning. Good morning. Um, the, the senator previewed some of your uh, <laughs> proposals here, so I want to talk to you in depth about that. But just level set for us here, um, because we have the congressional leaders getting in the same room with the president Tuesday. You said in March you've never been more pessimistic about negotiations. Where's your confidence level today? 
instead of being at the depths of the ocean, I'm merely drowning. I mean, if that, that tells you. So my level of optimism is from complete and utter pessimism. Anything could get done to some level of uh, modest pessimism now. Um, what's changed since that interview is that the House acted. We passed a debt ceiling increase with a Republican plan attached to it. Mm -hmm. It talks about growth. Just barely. Restraint, but we did. Mm -hmm. It's a narrow House. It's going to be a narrow vote. But we, we dealt with growth. We dealt with uh, immediate spending and long-term savings. So a balanced uh, program here. Now, we've sent this over to the Senate. The president said, show us your plan. We've not only shown them the plan, we've passed a plan. Mm -hmm. The Senate can't do it. Now, with 43 senators saying we're not going to go along with the Schumer plan for a clean debt increase, the, the Biden plan. And now the Bi President Biden has to come to the table for a negotiated solution. He needs to listen to his economic advisors, not his political advisors, and take this very seriously, given the late stage that we're currently at. You were just referencing a letter that was signed on to by a number of senators, including Minority Leader McConnell, um, who seems to be throwing his weight behind the Speaker of the House. Um, what does a bipartisan deal actually look like? It looks uh, a lot like the bill that we passed out of the House. It touches growth. It touches... That's dead on the rival in the Senate. You know that. Well, we sent a significant large bill that, uh, that brings down the, the cost of government by $4.5 trillion over the next decade. It's big, yes. But we sent growth, short-term cap steal on spending uh, so we can fund our government for the next two years without drama, and then long-term savings. So a pairing of one, two, and three, that's what a deal looks like. I've talked to a lot of senators, a lot of uh, Democrats and Republicans in the House and the Senate to try to see what a deal would look like. And at this stage of the game, the one key ingredient I don't have is what the administration would, would, would come to terms with. We have to have something that can pass, that addresses our fiscal house at a time where we have record inflation and record federal spending. And we need to have something that can both pass with Republicans and Democrats. Exactly. It has to be bipartisan. And you acknowledged it's going to be likely a narrow vote in the House. With the, the vote you did get through, there were four Republicans against it. Two of them have said they will never vote to raise the debt ceiling, Tim Burchett and Andy Biggs. So compromise is where you have to get here, right? I mean, but you're, you're but, saying this to a member of the House that actually passed a debt ceiling increase and right. a president who would not have a second meeting with the Speaker of the House. The first meeting was February 1st, where 100 yeah. days passed. Everyone knows in divided government you have to negotiate, and the president says he will not negotiate. So the absurdity of the position the president's put himself mm -hmm. in, where he is playing politics with the economy, is markedly different than previous debt ceiling increases, where Republicans have been viewed as the recalcitrants. We've actually done something, and the administration says we're not going to talk. The Treasury Secretary said today it's you all who are putting a gun to the head of the American economy. That is what she said. Um, and she's talking about the fact that... Hell of a statement on a day like today. It, it which is, shows but that it's all about politics for this administration, not about U.S. Treasuries are the bedrock, bedrock of the financial system. You know that very well. So don't you need to just say defaults off the table? And that's what we did by passing a plan. The president did not think we could pass a plan out of the House. So therefore, he said it's a clean debt ceiling or nothing. And so debt, a clean debt ceiling is now off the table with Republicans in the House and Senate saying time to negotiate between the speaker and the president. That's all we're saying. The speaker's not laid down a red line. Uh, those, that's been done in previous iterations of the debt ceiling by Democrats and Republicans in, in the legislative branch. He had, didn't do that. There are no red lines other than the fact that we must address our fiscal house at a time where federal spending is up 40 percent from pre-COVID levels. Mm -hmm. I think it's a reasonable thing for us to do. And in fact, that's what the American so, people say. Three out of four Americans say the president should negotiate with the speaker to address our fiscal I house. I want to get to banking, too, but just very quickly, is a short-term patch off the table, short-term lift to the debt ceiling? I think everything's on the table at this point. The key thing that has to be in this, in this equation is addressing our fiscal house, yeah. short term and long term. On the banking sector right now, last time you were here, you mentioned concern about some of the smaller banks in America, community banks being endangered. On Monday, the government, um, the FDIC, sold failed regional bank First Republic to J.P. Morgan Chase. That's the country's largest bank. It got even bigger here. Are you going to take action to address some of this, because there's concern on both sides of the aisle about big banks getting bigger. Yes, and the way we have to do this is, is, is I agree with uh, Michael Barr, the vice chair of the Fed's review. We have to provision for liquidity more quickly for these small, smaller banks. Uh, we have to make sure that we have a healthy banking arrangement across the whole spectrum. 
uh, and we have to ensure that banking models can exist in a, in a society where uh, bank runs can happen more quickly than ever before. But let's get to the fundamentals here. If, if we look at the reason why these banks, the three of the 30 largest banks in, the, mm -hmm. uh, in America have failed in the last two months, it's because of interest rate sensitivity of their balance sheet, which means they misjudged inflation. Mm -hmm. The Fed misjudged inflation, they've admitted it. They're behind the curve. The administration has been asleep at the switch for the supervisors wow. of these institutions, but the root cause of this is inflation. And if we can addra address inflation, right. it gets to the disease rather well, than functioning, uh, addressing the symptoms. Management choices and uh, hedging their bets could have been a big factor here when it came to the CEOs who ran these institutions. Absolutely. Are you going to call them in for testimony? And they're going to be in when? two weeks before the House Financial Services Committee. Uh, and this is going to be an important hearing. In the next two months, the House Financial Services Committee will have the, the CEOs of these, these failed institutions. We're going to have the regulators in, including Secretary Yellen mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Chair Powell. At the end of June, we're going to have our Humphrey Hawkins hearing to hear from uh, uh, the Chair of the Federal Reserve, uh, Jay Powell. Mm -hmm. uh, those are important dates in, the, in this uh, calendar, especially given the, the state of banking in America today. Uh, and all the pieces affecting um, the economy right now. I want to ask you as well, though, about the stability of the banking sector, um, because you had Jamie Dimon and Jay Powell, two of the most important people in the financial space, saying banks are solid. And then we saw all the volatility in the marketplace again this week, California's PacWest, Arizona's Western Alliance, those two regional banks under pressure. Are we going to see more government rescues? Unfortunately, we're not out of the woods. But what depositors need to understand is since 1933, when we enacted and created the Federal Deposit Insurance Commission, insured deposits have never had a penny of loss. Uh, we have 99% of the accounts in America are under the insured deposit uh, cap right. level. And so 99% of the deposits in America are safe and sound. What we have to do is address over a period of time uh, the safety and stability of smaller banks. At a time where the market is judging their business model, their interest rate sensitivity, and the assumption that regulators are going to require a lot more capital for these banks to, mm -hmm. uh, to exist, uh, they're making big assumptions. But the stability of the accounts, they're there. You've got your work cut out for you. Good to have you on the program today. We'll be watching May 9th, and we'll be right back. Late last week, North Carolina's Republican-led legislature passed a bill that would limit abortion access in the state. For more, we want to go to the state's Democratic governor, Roy Cooper, who joins us from Raleigh. Good morning to you, Governor. Good morning, Margaret. Uh, just to make it clear, abortion is currently permitted up to 20 weeks of pregnancy in your state. This bill coming out of um, your legislature would bring it down to 12 weeks, which, according to the CDC, would still allow more than 90 percent of abortions to continue. Republicans say they're offering a middle ground here. Why do you think this bill is too restrictive? They've dressed this up as a 12-week ban, but it's really not. They rammed through a bill in 48 hours with no public input, with no amendments that drastically reduces access to reproductive freedom for women. Uh, it'll effectively ban many abortions altogether because of the obstacles that they have created for women, for clinics, and for doctors. They have tried to disguise the disastrous impacts of this bill, but we're going to expose them. This bill has nothing to do with making women safer and everything to do with banning abortions. Well, we it, only need... Mm -hmm. so just to, to, so our viewers can follow along with you here. The bill would cut it off at the end of the first trimester, roughly 12 weeks. Uh, there would be um, an allowance for abortion up to 20 weeks in case of rape or incest, 24 weeks if there are fetal abnormalities. But what you're talking about are requirements like number of times you have to visit a doctor, information that a woman would have to share publicly. For, for sure. And also, in fact, for medication abortion, the bill specifically limits it to 10 weeks. And when with these additional requirements of three in-person visits that doctors have said are medically unnecessary, with more requirements put on clinics that are already strained with four-week backlogs of people, North Carolina has become an access point yeah. in the Southeast. And what this legislation is going to do is going to prevent many women from getting abortions at any time 
during their pregnancy because of the uh, obstructions that they have put here. Many of these clinics are working very hard to treat women, and now they're going to have many new medically unnecessary requirements that I think many of them are going to have to close. North Carolina uh, has become a haven in the South uh, because so many of your surrounding states have severely restricted access. Um, I know that you have, and we're showing a map there just to show where you are at the moment, but you have vowed to veto this bill, but your state legislature has a supermajority that could override it. So what is your plan to stop them? Well, first, we only need one Republican to keep a promise. At least four Republican legislators made promises to their constituents during this campaign that they were going to protect women's reproductive freedom. They only have a supermajority by one vote in the Senate and one vote in the House. And we've seen Republicans across the country step up. We saw them step up in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. We saw them step up in Nebraska because they know that people don't want abortion bans. And that's what this bill is. The more why would people they respond, find out about it. Why would they respond the, to your public calling out? Why do you think that would matter to them? Well, they don't have to answer to me. They have to answer to their constituents. So what I'm doing is trying to educate the public about the disaster that this bill is. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go into their districts. I'm going to go into their districts this week. We're going to have forums with doctors and advocates and women's, women who care deeply about the restrictions in this legislation, and we're going to educate the public. Look, yeah. they kept this bill under lock and key. They wouldn't let their own members take a copy out. The public only saw it for 48 okay. hours. It's 46 pages long, yeah. and it creates so many problems for women in clinics that it's going to operate as an effective ban, and we're not going to, we're not going to let them disguise this thing as something reasonable when it's not. Well, I mean, compared to some of your surrounding states, 12 weeks is is, is uh, more if, permissive. If, it were, if but, it were 12 weeks, Margaret, but it's right. not. It's well, not a 12-week ban. Okay. Um, you don't have the votes, though, to codify abortion access in the state of North Carolina. Why have Democrats— No, we do not. No. And so why have Democrats been so outmaneuvered on this issue? I mean, this just seems to be that even if you get rid of this bill, you're going to have this fight again and again and again. So where is the compromise? So the, the problem is we have super gerrymandered districts and the Democrats are in a super minority. Every single Democrat has signed a bill to enact Roe v. Wade standards. We're all standing together and fighting. And what we have to do now is defend ourselves from these right-wing politicians who want to go into the exam room with women and their doctors. You know, these right-wing politicians make crappy doctors, and they've gone in and defined medical terms. Doctors are looking at this legislation and say, what in the world does that mean? So what we're going to do is call them out. Look, there are four Republicans, four Republicans who said they would yeah. protect women's reproductive freedom during the campaign. All we need is one of them. We can block this disastrous legislation, and and then we can wait for the next right. battle. But what we're going to do is to continue to work to protect women's reproductive freedom in North Carolina. But you're just going to be on the defensive there. So, I mean, how well, does this actually get resolved? Or do you, Can you hold a referendum? Can you do anything? If you say the public's with you, how do you yeah. find a compromise? We're, we're not a referendum state. Yeah. We have gerrymandered districts, so we have a Republican majority. Thank goodness I'm a Democratic governor, so I can rally the troops. For four years, for four years, I have kept abortion legislation from becoming law that Republicans have passed. But in this election cycle, we we lost. They they gained a supermajority by one vote in each chamber. So now we're in a different position. We 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 held the yeah. held the line for four years. But if we can get a Republican to say, look, this is not right, yeah. like they did in South Carolina, like they did in Nebraska. And their constituents, okay. the more they learn, the more they are going to demand right. that these Republican legislators step up. All right, Governor, we'll leave it there. We'll be back in a moment. The fighting in Ukraine has intensified as Kyiv launches a series of drones in Crimea ahead of an expected spring counteroffensive against Russia. Senior foreign correspondent Charlie Daggett is in Dnipro with more. 
The battle for Bakhmut has burst into flames. Ukraine accusing the Wagner mercenary group of using banned incendiary weapons, possibly white phosphorus, posting videos is proof. Deploying them in civilian areas is a war crime. A ferocious parting shot as the head of Wagner, Yevgeny Prigozhin, declares he's pulling his forces out of Bakhmut by Wednesday, following a rant against Russian defense officials in front of dozens of corpses of his men, saying their blood is still warm, blaming their deaths on a severe lack of ammunition. The death toll after 10 months of fighting has run into the thousands, unsustainable losses for both sides. A sea of Ukrainian flags fly over the final resting place of the country's war dead. The Ukrainian government never reveals the true death toll of those soldiers killed in action. But these fresh graves tell their own story, including those they're preparing to fill. Ahead of the looming Ukrainian counteroffensive, Russia has gone on the offensive. The U.S. State Department clocked more than 150 airstrikes since the start of May. Ukraine has stepped up its attacks too, striking targets like fuel depots on Russian territory. It's still not clear who is behind the attempted drone strike at the Kremlin on Wednesday, but U.S. officials and Ukrainian experts tell CBS News it had to be launched from inside Russia. Maybe not the terrorist act to kill Putin, the Kremlin says it is. But it's an embarrassment ahead of a show of power for the president, Moscow's victory parade, an annual symbol of Russian military might, while the bloody battlefields of Ukraine tell a much different story. Although that Moscow parade is still scheduled to go ahead on Tuesday, more than 20 parades across Russia have been canceled, citing security concerns. Although there are questions about whether there are enough troops and equipment to put on display. Margaret? Charlie Daggett, thank you. We'll be right back. That's it for us today. Thank you for watching. For Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.